Free Cality here. Hello and welcome to another episode of Arbitrary Analysis. A place where I look at games I like and talk way too much about them. This episode will be all about Silent Hill. No, 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 not the movie. No, no not, not the whole franchise. The, the game. The first game. That's better. Released in 1999 for the PlayStation, this game is probably one of the main causes for gamers wetting their bets back then. And it's easy to see why. The way the game places you in the shoes of Harry Mason, a man that doesn't really know what's going on or what to do, both in story and in gameplay, really connected well with the fears of most players. The game does a very interesting use of visual sound effects, music and level design that creates such a frightening atmosphere that even the bravest players could have a hard time dealing with. Uh, the less we talk about the voice acting, the better. Huh. Radio. What's going on with that radio? Its intriguing story is also worthy of praise. With the very organic way the game reveals the details behind this curse down to you as the game goes on. The tank controls may feel dated and stuff, but God, God, I'm pretty sure you noticed that the video isn't called Silent Hill Review or anything like that, so I'm gonna stop myself right there. Am I really going to compare Silent Hill with newer games? Yeah, but I'm trying not to make it in an unfair way. And really, the fact that I chose Silent Hill is because it's one of the games that I think contains some of the best use of horror that for some reason has been neglected in recent years. This is all subjective and purely my opinion of course, so feel free to disagree and state your opinion in the comments. But for now, let's get on with it. The way Silent Hill tackles horror by today's standards may even seem a little alien. And really, it's not only something prominent in gaming, as it all mostly started in movies and keeps going to this date. I want to analyze all these concepts and compare them with some key moments in the first Silent Hill game. Interestingly enough, I noticed that most of this can be explored by looking at one very specific point in the game. The beginning. These are some of the most prominent concepts that I think Silent Hill achieves and showcases especially well in the first few minutes. Setting up. Right off the bat, the game sets up its story structure, its elements, its concept, its mysteries and its characters and you haven't even pressed start. It's a noteworthy intro sequence because while it does reuse a lot of the same cutscenes that are played throughout the game, at least half of its content is completely exclusive to this sequence including the actual setup to the story. The fact that the game doesn't play the car crash a second time once the player starts up the game is one of those things you don't see anymore. The intro sequence is something just used as a demo reel or as a showcase of the best sequences in the game. Here it ends and as soon as you press start, you see what happened right afterwards. But that is not the only good way this game sets up its story. Silent Hill's story in its most basic form couldn't be simpler and the game portrays it to you before any character can even attempt to talk. The intro shows you a plethora of characters, but focuses mainly on a man and a girl in a car. It even shows you the same man with a baby in his arms next to a woman, presumably his wife. The way these two act shows a familiar relationship. It makes sense to assume she will be his daughter. Soon, you see how a woman appears in front of the car and makes it spin out of control and crash. As soon as you start the game, we return to the man, our main character, and the girl is gone. Instantly, you know what his motivation is, and what the goal throughout the rest of the game is going to be. Find your daughter. The game could easily stop introducing your story here and it will be a scary premise by itself, but of course, the story has a lot more depth than that. Still, it's quite fitting that it doesn't spell it out to you by itself because the sense of mystery and confusion is exactly what the Silent Hill franchise is all about. It's about time I introduce the games I will be using as comparisons, so without further ado... Yes, Slender. Could this be any more unfair comparison? We'll see. Slender, in terms of setting up, is probably the complete opposite of Silent Hill. The game directly assumes that you are familiar to the concept of Slenderman beforehand, and a later version simply has links to some related content you can read if you want, and throws you into the forest. Story isn't really important to this game, although it does make you wonder why getting these 8 pages will do any difference in the circumstances, not that they ever address this, mind you. 
And don't even try to bring up the sequel. The tactile intro really just creates more logic jumps than it solves. For one, there's still no explanation as to why these pages will actually achieve anything because... Really? Clues? And making the character you're looking for to be the main character of the first one doesn't really make much of a difference at all because she didn't really matter either. Okay, okay. So I basically trashed on Slender. Who's next? Oh... Really? Wow, so it can get more unfair. Um, well, I might as well get on with it. Five Nights at Freddy's setup is surprisingly thorough, considering it's also the type of fourth what concept that doesn't really rely on the player caring about the character as much as their own skin. But really, the game does a very valiant effort of showing you the situation the game set and why you should be scared while your cheek is stuck to its giant tongue. Truly, if I didn't know otherwise, I would have thought that Five Nights at Freddy's was nothing more than a satiric jab towards the indie horror crowd. It's somewhat foreboding atmosphere completely devoid of logic, anachronistically set besides the ridiculous design. Well, it really speaks to me that way. And at least in that degree, the game does succeed in setting up everything it should, so um, good job. I guess. Well, we should move on to the next point. Wait, another game? Seriously? What is it this time? Oh, you. Amnesia the Dark Descent is a critically acclaimed new title called by many to be one of the scariest, most scary scare scares in the history of scares. I'm sorry, I just. Uh, let's focus on setting up. Uh, Amnesia does a valiant effort in setting up your situation, although by itself it's so highly unrelatable either in familiarity or with expectations that it doesn't really seem to do much at all. The game introduces the concept of your character not remembering anything and its unexplained goal of killing somebody. Oh, also, you're being haunted by things. Yeah, don't forget that. Mm. Anyways, atmosphere. Phew, back to Silent Hill. I don't know where to be relieved or disturbed. Silent Hill, right at the beginning, introduces you to the eponymous town and it feels as chilling as it ever has. This is a way that limitations of hardware led to spice of creativity. Because the PlayStation couldn't render the town as far as it should, the game introduced the concept of the mist to render the town as the player moves through it. While it's a brilliant way to go through that problem, it made for a brilliant display of game design. Silent Hill only heightened its creepy factor up to 11 because of this. The fact that you're in a very open town, but you can hardly see anything past a few meters, creates the illusion of claustrophobia that the situation demanded. You are stuck in here, with no seeming ways to get out. The concept is already in your face and nobody explained it to you. As you proceed to the game, the atmosphere only gets better, as the game introduces you, albeit in a much more restrained fashion, to its two world mechanics by inexplicably turning to nighttime even though you're still in the open. It's such subtlety in game design that really heightens the threat of playing this type of horror games. Oh, the, the other games, right. In terms of atmosphere, the way it evokes fright is something unquestionable in any of these three games, but let's look at them closely. All of these games feature very dreadful and tense atmospheres, but they are very resistant to change, especially two of them. Both Slender and Five Nights at Freddy's have no real ramp when it comes to their atmosphere. What you see is what you'll get all throughout the experience. At some point, it can reach diminishing returns, as there are no moments to which to contrast them to. Unless you count real life, which is what it seems they were aiming for. Amnesia, on the other hand, does have a more interactive way to handle its atmosphere with its use of lightning, although retaining the concept of constant fright that the other ones have. Silent Hill is much more restrained in this regard. It offers calm parts to catch your breath, but scares you indirectly with the concept of the unknown. The others are much more straightforward with what you'll get. As soon as you've seen what it can offer, you already know what to expect. Maybe not Amnesia, but its main issue is about... Well, we might as well get right to it. Three-way marriage. Gameplay, setting, and atmosphere. I'm not going to argue that Silent Hill's control scheme is an outdated or that it's intuitive in any way. 
but nobody can deny that it puts you directly inside Harry Mason's shoes. He's a man, a simple man. He has no training with guns that we know of, he has no efficiency as a fighter, he defends himself as well as you can manage to push him to. He can run away, if you can, or he can shoot and waste some ammo, if you want. And of course, the game presents how defenseless Harry really is right at the beginning. After the masterful display of imagery, we are presented with our first enemies. Deformed looking childlike creatures sporting razor sharp blades. And you have nothing to defend yourself with. You can try to run, but there's no escape. And soon enough, you'll fail. It's a great setup to its gameplay mechanics as well, and as soon as you get a weapon introduced to you, you feel like you won't be so defenseless. But ammo is scarce, so yeah, and closing in on those things is, well, dangerous. So you do as you can. In Slender, you have a flashlight, and the enemy kills you in sight. Well, your sight. It's a can and mouse style of game, so its gameplay is basic. And while it does tie in well to its concept and its atmosphere, some design choices boggle my mind. For instance, considering how essential the flashlight is to play in the game, there's no real reason to turn it off, other than because it's a thing you can do in real life. And again, why collecting the pages is a thing that should matter. Uh, moving on. The Five Nights at Freddy's, on the other hand, is completely separated in this regard. The story by itself is simple and to the point, but the gameplay by itself is simple to the point, but they aren't very well put together. Being stuck in one room with limited power is great for the management type of game it really is, but why would you really do that if you can actually attempt to hide in other better lit rooms in the situation you're in? Uh, I don't know. And of course, Amnesia. <sighs> Where to begin with this one? The design of this game is bonkers. Yeah, that should do. The game is by itself an amalgam of management, puzzles, and stealth mechanics, but not a single one of them is that very well implemented. The management comes in the form of sanity mechanics, where you have to stay in light or make progress to retain your sanity, and you lose it by being in the dark or looking at scary things. The thing is, it's highly inconsistent in what is considered a light source. And from a story perspective, staying in the light for a while to regain some sanity doesn't only make no sense, but it's so secondary to the actual story that it only serves as a nuisance. On the other hand, the puzzle solving is highly superficial, and very well thought out, with most of it being simple fetch quests, or jiggling with the controls until it works. And finally, the stealth, by direct relation, the enemies. I wouldn't mind the stealth mechanics. Picking up anything to throw and ducking around to avoid the enemy seems like a very immersive way of tackling the concept of a chasing entity. But it all goes out the window once you realize the best thing you can do in Amnesia to dodge the enemies is dying. Seriously, it's dying. The checkpoints are so frequent that the game saves almost exactly right before you face an enemy. And the problem with that is that once you die and respawn, the enemy is gone. GONE! So what's the penalty of being careless? Starting over? Loading from a manually set part that could be long before you got there? No, the game goes, oh poor baby, here, the Batman won't get you anymore. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, this really, really irks me. I think it's about time we directly tackle the horror aspects of it. Oh, oh, wait. What? Story. Story? That's so unfair. Uh, whatever. Silent Hill. Is there anything I can say that will explain how masterfully crafted this game's story is? Brilliantly paced, visually engaging, variety of characters, lack of personalities at times, admittedly, a mix of personal and global fears, a psychologically charged design, some of the most deep exploration of concepts that I do not wish to spoil to anybody not familiar with the game, and of course, its now iconic multiple ending mechanic. Now, to say Slender's story is lacking is both a severe understatement and a complete low blow to the game's concept, so I won't even go there. 
Five Nights at Freddy's is pretty much the same, although it astounds me to hear about people seriously discussing the secrets and themes that the story tackles, while the game's giggling at you in the corner. Seriously, most of its story developments are nothing more than overuse against almost satirically gags to explain, oh, you're in trouble now. That nothing to the game are completely superficial. And seriously, the fact that some kids disappeared a while ago, an important plot point in the game where you're immediately presented with killer animatronic animals. And Amnesia, which is probably the least unfair comparison here. And honestly, I can say that Amnesia has a very engaging story by itself. I do think, though, that the game itself is only a detriment to its story. I am a fan of narrative-driven games, quite a big one, actually. But Amnesia seems to like hanging out in the fence between a pure horror game and a narrative-driven game, without really merging both of them together in any tangible way. I could enjoy the story of Amnesia by itself the same way I enjoyed the story of Bioshock Infinite by itself, but the story of Amnesia suffers by adding elements just to explain its gameplay designs. For instance, there's no real reason to even have enemies in the game. It adds nothing to the story and is there just because- BOO! SCARE! <sighs> So it's it's time, right? The horror. Finally. Silent Hill's style of horror is all about tension, subtlety, and its story. The game has a very scarce amount of jump scares, and those it has are usually done as payoff to its constant ramp up in tension. I like to showcase a specific moment in the game where I actually thought that the game was pandering to the traditional jump scare, but in reality it was actually deconstructing. There's a moment, about a quarter into the game, maybe earlier, where you get to a locker room. In there, you start to hear a loud thumping from one of the lockers. The locker seems to move, and so you open it, and... BOOM! A cat! Yeah, a cat. The overused cat cheap scare is right in Silent Hill. But right afterwards... Right. And even though Silent Hill itself saved that jumpscare by that following moment, it really isn't even the payoff. The payoff occurs when you switch to the other world and return to the same locker room. The thumping is back, even louder than before it seems. And so, you reach to open it, and... Wait, what? Holy shit. So the classic jumpscare from before was actually the setup to one of the greatest ways a game has ever fucked with the expectations of the <clears throat> the expectations of the player. Uh, it's interesting how none of the three games we looked at here rely on this sort of horror. By now, you know for a fact I'm gonna go, oh, horror is dead, modern horror sucks. But truly, and here's the kicker. That's not what I'm doing. The idea behind this video is to look at horror from different perspectives. Horror is probably one of the most subjective genres and it's easy to look at games and movies today and say that horror is becoming dumber or overly reliant on reflexive behavior. I've always said that a jump scare isn't really scary unless the picture that is used for it can be taken by itself and created an unnerving feeling on the person. Because otherwise, a jump scare can be used in any genre or by any person, and have the same effect while not being considered scary. And honestly, I actually feel that a pure horror game is a flawed concept. I stand by that, but I understand the desire of being frightened by something as superficial as a cheap scare. How that houses and roller coasters are a thing. Is horror truly dead? No, but we are watching horror grow in completely different ways, either in film or in gaming. I'm not happy to see movies like Weeha, Mama, or the Paranormal Activity sequels get such revenue, because it seems to send a message saying that horror doesn't require effort. But let's look at these games I'm showcasing. One may argue that Amnesia may be closer to the way Silent Hill deals with horror, but its emphasis seems to be more akin to an amalgam of a lot of things some achieve with more success than others. Amnesia is a very important game to look at because it serves as a showcase of the potential of trying to do many different things at once. The focus of the design may rely merely on the scares, of course, but it's interesting the way such an inconsistent experience can actually achieve in terms of immersion. But why Slender? 
why not choose a much more similar game in style? Because it's important to look at Slender. Slender is an important game. It's the pillar of modern horror games, for better or for worse. It may not be the first of its kind, but it really serves as the perfect example of the modern horror game. The game is all about the scares, the jump scares, the payoff. It doesn't care about concept, characters or subtlety. It's all about the scare. Just as horror movies today are made simply for the Halloween crowd to feel scared of things that may or may not be scary, like haunted houses and slasher flicks, Slender appeals to this as well. Also to the YouTube Let's Player crowd, but that's a different story. And on the other side, we have Five Nights, which is a completely different entity. Five Nights is an interesting game to look at because it wears itself on its sleeve. Everything I've talked about regarding both Slender and Amnesia is present in one way or another throughout this game, and it's a really good way of atomizing the concepts one by one. You have the constantly tense atmosphere, the purely visual threat of the enemies, the heavy relying on jump scares, and its seeming disconnection to any semblance of an evolving story. So what did we learn? Well, for starters, we are definitely sending similar messages in regard to effort when it comes to gaming, but it's easy to see why. It's hard to admit, but sometimes a cheap thrill is all somebody may need when it comes to horror. If so, then what is really the point of this video? To acknowledge the separation. The solution to this so-called problem isn't to get rid of either of them. It's to stop looking at them as mutually exclusive. If video games are an art form, and I openly believe they are, we have to look at the others. In film, we've come to cope with the idea that we can have the Transformers and the Citizen Kane's or the exorcists and the mamas. And while we can't criticize either of them by our own opinions, the fact that the other one exists is what gives us the comparison to say what's good based on our own judgment. Silent Hill may be my type of horror game. I personally prefer a much more cohesive and in-depth experience than a more eventful yet substantially shallow one. But I can't, in good judgment, condemn somebody for enjoying these other games. All I can do is acknowledge the difference, assess my tastes, and move on. Because if somebody else enjoys what I enjoy, more of that should come to be. Maybe even we might learn something from Anisha and just push everything together. This is Ripley. Last survivor of the Nostromo. Oh yeah, here we go. For a person such as myself that felt completely underwhelmed by the style of horror that Amnesia presented me, I came to adore the first few moments of this game. The tension ramping up, the mechanics of hiding are you know, unexploitable and well implemented, the story is central to its gameplay, and of course, the game truly punishes you for fame. Old school horror modernized. This is one of the latest showings that the marriage is possible. But Alien? Really? I mean, of course the cat came from there, but that shouldn't really matter. If I'm going to end on one game to showcase my points, it should end where it all began. Subtle Horror The sound concept of Silent Hill and the what's going on factor. Everything much more emphasized, now possible thanks to new technology. The atmosphere of the older games, the build-up of the newer games, and of course, the masterful release of tension that could only be done by such a combination. I can't wait to see how Silent Hills is gonna be, but if PT is a show of what it can achieve, then I think any horror fan, no matter what side of the spectrum is in, should come out of the experience highly satisfied. And considering buying some new pants. This has been Arbitrary Analysis. Thanks for watching. Puedo tocar